And we thought we should start the morning with a wide-angle look at this country's economic state. And we're going to do that with the help of Jason Furman. He's the chairman of the White House Council on Economic Advisors. Leading that conversation is my great colleague, The Atlantic's Washington editor-at-large, Steve Clemens. Steve, Jason, take it away. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Great to be with all of you. Uh, Jason, thanks for joining us again. I think I should start because we had you know, this, this picture of the Lincoln penny over there. I'm just wondering, is Lincoln safe on the penny? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Oops. Okay, so, sorry, you couldn't hear what I said about yeah. that last one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Microphone problem, so, but I'm sure it's all been straightened out. Right, so, so Lincoln on the penny is safe. You know, the president had spoken in, um, in 2008 and reiterated in 2014 some concerns about the cost effectiveness of the penny. So that's something oh, so we're the, taking so a look at. So the penny may disappear, but it has nothing it to is, do with like removing presidents. It does cost more to make a penny than a penny is worth. And there's only no other country in the world or few other countries that's in the world. That's a tweetable moment already in this conference, folks. Uh, uh, in any case, thank you. So let me, let, let's get serious for a minute. I want to say, so we had- Just for a minute. Yeah, we had, just for a minute. We had a primary in five states last night and there was um, just, a, just a sweep for Donald Trump. Hillary Clinton uh, did well in four of the five states and, and this is coming out, but, it, but when you, anyone that gets into it looks at the, there's this boiling frustration and anger, particularly in working class America, about economic circumstances. And last time we had you here, we had had amazing job growth, we had the unemployment rate coming down. What do you think is not connecting with Americans that are frustrated politically? You know, I'm not a, a political analyst, so I don't have any interpretation of last night. But in terms of the economy, there's two things that are true. And they're both true, and I don't think it's that hard to hold them both in your head. One is that we've made enormous progress. We've made enormous progress compared to where we were eight years ago, to where other countries have gone in the wake of the crisis, and to what's happened in terms of past crises. But the second thing is also true, which is wage growth has been below what we'd like to see. That comes on top of decades of subpar income growth. And the fact that we have such high levels of inequality shows us that we could do better in terms of income that we've had. And so you simultaneously want to point out the steps we've taken that have helped put us in this position and then say we actually need more of those. You know, we've done some infrastructure, mm -hmm. but we actually need more infrastructure investment. We raised the minimum wage in legislated in 2007. A lot of states have raised it since then. We need to raise it at um, the federal level too. So, you know, progress, but a lot more needed. When you, when you talk about that and you think, okay, you know, you're, you, just the, the clock is ticking on your time in the Obama administration. And as you look at the next, you know, nine or so months, say you have a democratic administration, perhaps chance, what would be the two or three biggest framing things that you think, would it be infrastructure? Would it be minimum wage? Are those big enough to really uh, substantially move the needle on uh, economic performance across these different sectors? So I'm, I'm interested why you're in there, what you're doing, and then I'm interested if you were to get another four years, what would you really prioritize? Well, look, the president is laying out the agenda he thinks this country should have for the future. If you look at something like his State of the Union, that wasn't a to-do list for Congress in the year 2016. That was a to-do list for the country over a period of time, and he's using his time to advance that agenda. If you look at all the different economic ideas we've put forward, the one that's quantitatively largest for our economy mm -hmm. is actually immigration reform. Interesting. And it helps offset one of the big challenges we face economically, which is our demographic headwinds. But it also increases productivity and innovation, not just by bringing in high-skilled people, although that's important, but also by taking the undocumented people here that are living in the shadows and giving them more confidence so they can move to the right job for them, make an investment in a business, send their children um, to school. So that's the most important thing that we could do economically. Infrastructure, 
might be the biggest no-brainer economically when you compare what interest rates are, our borrowing costs, to the rate of return on infrastructure. And then I think our business tax code is broken. Other countries have all lowered their rates. We're in a global environment. It's really hard to function. But at the same time, we have tons and tons of loopholes and an international system that collects basically no revenue while causing a bunch of distortions. Now you've written about the business tax code recently in a really terrific piece that I commend to people, and I guess it's in uh, Democracy, right, Democracy yep. Journal, um, on what progressive tax reform should look like. I commend it because it's a brave piece, but you really go into the business tax reform in great detail and, and why it shouldn't be as big a lift as it is. And, and when you sort of look, whether, whether you take the Republican caucus or you take the Democratic caucus, I know uh, people in the White House, what is the barrier to getting that done? Because we've had a lot of talk about corporate inversions and penalizing companies that go elsewhere and just some very nasty language. But a lot of those companies say the problem is the tax code. Oh, we agree. The best thing to do about corporate inversions would be to reform the tax code as a whole, both to make it more attractive to be in America, right. to make it harder to take advantage of an offshore address and moving money back and forth, and to not allow you to invert in the way that you're allowed to invert today. That comprehensive solution is the best way to do it. Um, Congress hasn't done that comprehensive solution, so the Treasury has taken action where it can act. I think the biggest question is what type of conversation do we want to have? Do we want to have a conversation about steps we need to take to increase our growth and strengthen our economy? And businesses are mobile. They right. really can move. And so we do have to take into account rates in the rest of the country. Or that's, that's one conversation. There's a separate conversation of we want to cut taxes for high income households just because. You know, that second one is not a conversation that the president has been willing to have. It's not one that you know, I expect us as a country to be able to afford to do. But to some degree, it's hijacked some of the business tax agenda, tax reform conversation by talking about lowering the individual rate too. And when you're lowering the individual rate, you're basically cutting taxes for high income Can households. you delink them? Or I think as an economic matter, you absolutely can delink them. In fact, you should, because corporate taxes, you pay at two levels. A corporation pays a corporate tax, and then the dividends or capital gains get taxed at a second level. So you actually should have a different corporate rate than individual rate and should have a lower one. The other thing I noticed recently is you co-wrote a piece and have been out sort of looking at the cost of incarceration, over-incarceration. Uh, mandatory sentencing, and you've been doing it, a lot of this with Doug Holtz Eakin, uh, who was John McCain's economic advisor. And um, do you hang out with a lot of Republican rivals uh, in the economic area? I mean, what, what, what is that like, and what are you trying to communicate? Look, I think one of the great things about economics is it creates an environment in which you have a conversation based on data and based on certain theoretical ideas. My main thesis advisor when I did my PhD at Harvard was Greg Mankiw. Mm -hmm. Greg Mankiw had my job under President Bush. I worked on economic policy on the Kerry campaign while Greg was advising President Bush and we would regularly have you know, lunch or dinner together and talk through issues and, and debate them. You know, How vigorously um, would you debate them? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, you know won't say who I think uh, won the debates. <laughs> but, you know, and I think you know, there's a bunch of issues that are hard to figure out the correct answers. There's a bunch of issues where I think there is a correct answer and it's frustrating to me um, that the other side doesn't see it that way. But then there's some issues like criminal justice where you know, we've embarked on a massive change in our sentencing policies over the last couple decades in this country that weren't grounded in social science. They right. weren't research founded. In fact, research has very consistently found if you take a long prison sentence and make it even longer, that has very little deterrent effect. And has very little deterrent effect because criminals tend not to be 
really sort of far-sighted thinking hard about the future. They have very high discount rates. And so you take a 20-year <laughs> sentence and make it a 22-year sentence. They don't say, oh, wait, you know, as I'm planning the next decades of my life, that would get in the way of it. Um, so adding to sentences, and then you take people off the streets at age 50, right. um, they weren't going to be the ones committing the crime. So research was not the reason that the United States got in the position of having more higher incarceration rate than any country in the world other than the Seychelles. It was political reasons. Um, I think research and social science can help counter it, and that's something that Doug and I and an event we co-sponsored with AEI at the White House this past week. How's the reaction to it been? The reaction's been really positive, and I think there's a strong business case, there's a strong economic case. You know, I don't speak a lot to you know, morality and religion, but people who come from that perspective have made strong cases in those dimensions as well. There's both the House and Senate Judiciary Committees have reported out legislation that would reduce prison sentences. We also need to look at the way we reincorporate people into society and into jobs. And I think this is a, um, you know, a great conversation. We're I, I'm really country. interested in this. So, you know, oftentimes when you move from one presidential administration to the other, one of the big political science questions constantly asked is about continuity. And do you think that the sort of spade work you're, you've been doing in laying this is something that regardless who, of who follows as president will be continuous because you've reached out, you found people like Holt Eakin and others to, to, to lay out a set of data and do and you think it is harder to undo this, this move um, to basically get great, you know, more sense in sentencing? Um, I think this will um, make a lot of progress both this year um, and in the coming years. I think that's only going to grow. Do you think that the example of what you're doing and working across the aisle intellectually and politically is having any effects anywhere else? Or is this looked at as a one-off, like, oh, this is Jason Furman uh, doing his thing with, with, no, with one guy? I mean, in, in other words, can it go viral um, in other is, areas? You know, on the issue of criminal justice, people throughout the White House are working with you know, the Koch brothers, for example. Could you say that um, again, please? <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, we work across the aisle on the Trans-Pacific Partnership and passing that, which is really important. Um, we've worked across the aisle on immigration reform. You have a coalition of business as well as law enforcement and the faith community. So there's a lot of issues where this has happened, and you know I, I think that makes I think that's great when that happens. I think debates are important too. There's places where the two parties have different views, and and we've had you know debates over you know what you want to do about the sequester, for example. Let me ask you, you know, a question, you know, again, another thing that's happening politically right now is there seems to be, in both parties, a greater skepticism of the benefits of trade. Uh, and you're an expert in trade, you sort of look at that, I know you're on board with the administration's plans on TTIP and TPP and, you know, see that. But where do you think those that are skeptics of trade, and you have people like Bernie Sanders, you know, criticizing Hillary Clinton you know, in a way for saying, giving a wink and nod to the financial industry, giving a wink and nod to multinationals engaged in trade. Where do they have a point and where are they wrong? Uh -huh. Look, I think trade in the abstract is a really difficult issue. Mm -hmm. It embodies a lot of what's been important and successful about our economy and leading to productivity growth and expanded choices to consumers. But it's also caused substantial displacement and played a role in inequality. The challenge that we have and that we're working on is the question isn't trade. There's no vote in Congress, you're for trade or against trade. Mm -hmm. The vote Congress is going to have is, are you for the Trans-Pacific Partnership right. or are you against the Trans-Pacific Partnership? And then you have to look at what's in it. What's in it is 18,000 tariff cuts on American exporters, disproportionately removing non-tariff barriers that other countries have you know, in a way that we don't have. It's much higher labor and environmental standards than these countries otherwise would have had, places like Malaysia mm -hmm. and Vietnam. And it's, um, 
you know, a range of other measures like state-owned enterprises and the like that set an example for what these agreements should be in the future. So we need to be having a conversation about the specifics and the particulars, not, you know, the broad concept. You know, I'm about to interview someone via Skype from London uh, who advocates Britain leaving uh, the European Union Brexit, and we're going to have people kind of commenting against, but you had President Obama over really uh, telling the, the, the citizens of the UK that this could be highly disruptive both to them but also to the global economy. Wolfgang Schäuble uh, in Germany has made some of the same comments. How do you feel about Brexit? Or is, it, is, it, is it more uh, flurry than, than, than it deserves to attention? I mean, what, what do you think would be the real substantive impacts on economic performance globally if, if Britain were to leave Europe? I don't think there's been a single credible economic analysis put forward that finds anything other than Brexit would be harmful to the UK economy, harmful to the European economy, and harmful to the global economy. You could debate the magnitude of that harm. You know, if you were in the UK, you could debate, is it worth paying an economic price and having higher unemployment and more economic disruption to achieve um, some other goals? But I don't think you can debate um, I don't think you can credibly make an argument that somehow this would be good for any aspect of the economy. And the reason is that Britain would for years be consumed with a disruptive mm. debate over how to structure its exit that could spiral into other debates within parts of the UK or other parts of Europe. And you know, the, the single market has been you know, very successful. It has powered really strong, you know, European growth, really strong UK growth, and the global economy doesn't need that type of uncertainty and disruption, especially at a moment like today. If you were to be, if we were to put you and just make you all powerful and put you in charge <laughs> of Europe, I've got the Greek finance minister, former Greek finance minister here later, how would you fix Europe economically? <laughs> You know, one of the quickest and surest things, tools we have in economics mm. is aggregate demand. Mm. And in the Eurozone... It seems to be collapsing everything, um, right? The, the Euro, yeah. And in the Eurozone, the unemployment rate is over 10%. Mm. When our unemployment rate was 10%, we thought it was the worst crisis we had in this country since the Great Depression, and we wouldn't rest until we got that unemployment rate down to 5 and we're still not resting. You know, so one thing they need is more demand. And demand is one of the few levers you have that can make a couple percentage point in difference in GDP growth on a short time horizon. You know, within demand, they have underemphasized fiscal policy. So the need for more fiscal expansion in places that have space or slower fiscal consolidation in other places. The fact that interest rates are so low in Europe, lower in most of the countries than we have here in the United States even, suggests that there is um, substantial fiscal room. The fact that inflation is so low suggests that the risks of overheating are trivial compared to the risks mm. of maintaining the situation. So that's the number one thing that needs to be done, investments in infrastructure, investment tax incentives, um, and the like on the fiscal side. Structural reform can matter too. That tends to be more of a medium and long run thing. Europe, even prior to the crisis, had a productivity growth problem. We all do. Ours has right. slowed as well, but theirs has slowed even more to a lower level. I think structural reforms are important, but I don't think we should fetishize them or use them as an excuse not to do the time-tested recipe of, of more Let me ask you uh, one other question. I'm going to go to the audience uh, for, for a few minutes. Uh, one of, I guess an area of the Atlantic has spent a lot of time writing about this last year is essentially the, the problems we have, the speed bumps in inclusion. So inequality, but also just the sort of biases built in the system, which just amount to a lot of bigotry and racism. Uh, women not getting on par in, in, a, in a parody in fact during White House Correspondents Weekend. For those of you interested, we're doing a thing on the un, unfinished and the never-ending revolution of the women's rights revolution and, and, and why that is there. But I know you deal very substantially at a lot of the macro level, but if you were to put smart things in place that began to deal with these disparities 
that just are unfair, that have been exclusionary, that have been bundled up and burdened, you know, certain racial categories in the United States, what are just some of the things that ought to be on the list that people think about that we need to move the needle on? I mean, that's such a big question. One issue that we've spent a lot of time on at the Council of Economic Advisors mm. is work-life balance. Right. And, you know, I use the word life, not family, because I'm trying to broaden it out from the women's angle you asked, because this is an issue all of us face in our jobs. And the United States is the only advanced economy that doesn't have paid leave, right. for example. Mm -hmm having that, and we've seen a number of states like New York State move forward and do that, and that's terrific. Doing it at the national level would be really important. The president supported mandatory paid sick days. You know, a lot of this isn't a law, though. A lot of this is choices that businesses make about how to organize their workplaces in a more flexible manner. So that's one step we could take that would help you know, remedy the fact that the United States is now tied with Japan in terms of the fraction of women between 25 and 54 you know, in the workforce, and Japan is rising, and we're flat and falling. And it would also help uh, men, and, and frankly, it would just help our society. When you leave your office in January 2017, you walk out the door, what do you predict the unemployment rate will be? <laughs> Not going to fall for that one. <laughs> OK. Uh, anyway, let's, let me open up the floor here. I think we've got microphones here. Let me go to Jed Schilling. Jed, we just have a few minutes, so short questions, short answers. We'll do lightning round. Oh, OK. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm an economist, and uh, just a quick three questions on your fiscal policy. One on the minimum wage, once you've set a reasonable level for it, wouldn't it make sense to then have it linked to the uh, rise in the consumer price index so the real level stays the same and maybe use a okay. consumer price index based on the consumption pattern of poor people, not necessarily the whole thing, which could be distorted for them. The second thing, on dividends, wouldn't it make sense to have dividends tax deductible for corporations like interest payments so their choice between capital, between borrowing and raising capital would be the same, and then all dividends paid to recipients would be fully taxed on their level. And on the third thing, wouldn't it be good to eliminate or nearly eliminate the benefits to the capital gains tax, which are really primarily on speculation about the movements of stocks and property and stuff. Very little of that is based on original new investment, and if you could prove it was original new investment, Maybe Thank get some you. special deal. Thank you. And, and this super is before 10 a.m. in D.C. Super fast answers. Yeah, um, absolutely, yeah. the minimum wage should be indexed to inflation once you get it to its proper level. Your second question, there's a huge bias in the tax code towards um, indebtedness and towards over leverage. Mm. We would address that by actually limiting the deductibility of interest rather than doing it on the dividend side. Um, capital gains, that was sort of hard to answer very quickly. I think one of the big issues that we focused on there is the big loophole um, that you avoid capital gains at death, and that creates a bunch of disparities and locks in investment. Interesting. Right here in the front. And everyone, this is Lindsay Polloway, and just thank her for running around. Yes. OK. My name is Mark Carr, and I'm the founder of Social Solutions. Right. Um, and we do look at data to try to address incarceration rates. So my question is sort of, going deeper into your last question sure. on disparity. And I think you gave a really good example on um, how you're working to reduce the gender disparity. But can you speak um, more on, or, or give an example on how you're working to reduce racial disparities, specifically with the unemployment rates? Thank you so mm -hmm. much. So the first thing to understand is that in the recession, the unemployment rate for black Americans went way up, higher and faster than it did for whites. In the recovery, as we strengthen the economy, the opposite actually happened. It fell and has fallen faster than the unemployment rate for whites. So I think one important lesson in that is that overall economic policy in a stronger economy actually does benefit all groups. If you look at the black unemployment rate now, it's below where it was prior to the recession. It's also above 9%. So you know, it's almost like a recession. Um, but it's the same recession we've had um, for decades. The president has an issue called My Brother's Keeper um, that you probably know about that focuses on a range of things from schooling to mentorship to trying to also address you know, discrimination in the workplace and other aspects 
to address this issue, but it's, it's, it's a big and important one. Do you think, just to, 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 to wrap this up, because I know you need to get back, um, a lot of what's been discussed is the need for sort of a second chance economy, that people that have gone through uh, incarceration levels, and I've talked to uh, people that have been trying to sort of train, you know, get people, make lifelong learning real, but oftentimes those people who make the expenditure time, go get trained on something, have a really hard time breaking into human resources departments that don't want to take risks. They want to get person out of college. Do you think we need to do more on giving people an ongoing chance, a second chance to make that lifelong learning concept more real, more, you know, more than just a, a catchphrase? Yeah, absolutely. And this is something we need to do at every level. There are tens of thousands of different laws and regulations that prevent ex-felons from getting jobs and starting businesses. In many states, these occupational licensing restrictions are unrelated to whether it was a violent crime, how far in the past it was, or whether it has any relationship at all to the job that you're getting now. So getting rid of some of those restrictions and then businesses you know, not you know, at the front end screening and throwing out anyone regardless of what the conviction was, but incorporating that information, if at all, uh, much later in the process when the evidence says, you know, you've decided the person's a good employee, you're willing to hear them out and, and hear the explanation for what's there. We've made changes in the federal government in the way we do our hiring. We're encouraging businesses to do the same. A number of them have pledged um, that over the last couple of weeks with something that we've helped organize. But there's also a lot of different regulations that are going to need change. I mean, this is actually a great deregulation agenda that would help give people a second chance. Ladies and gentlemen, Jason Furman, Chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, sir. Thank Thanks. you.